Hello and welcome to Connections 2021 and our panel on building an army of wargamers. We have three people lined up for you today. Damian O'Connell is a military historian, world recognized facilitator of decision games with wide experiences, including most recently as a non-resident fellow with the Marine Corps University's Brook Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare. Tim Smith has worked in analytic methodology, multi-warfare analysis, and modeling and simulation in the Farragut Technical Analysis Center since the mid-1980s. He also runs the Annapolis Area Strategy Gaming Club and conducts validation testing of historical war game designs for commercial vendors. Trained as an economist, Dr. Nolan Noble is a research scientist in the Center for Naval Analysis Operational Warfighting Division. Cumulatively, he has spent a year deployed at sea aboard Navy warships, and when not at sea, he has been focusing on extracting tasks from doctrine and designing training-focused war games, including Carrier Hunt and EAB Hunt. So, I believe we're going to begin with Damien O'Connell. I thought I was going last, but I can go first. Yeah. I apologize. I screwed up. No worries. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start, given that my slides are up. Um, so I'm relatively new to professional wargaming. This is my first connections, and this is my first professional wargaming conference. I was a bit surprised and certainly honored to be asked to speak about this. Um, I've designed about four wargames thus far, and when I think about building an army of wargamers, there are two games that I've designed that come to mind, Carrier Hunt and EAB Hunt. Just a quick spoiler alert advertisement, tomorrow at 1430 Eastern, I'm gonna talk about EAB Hunt in much more detail. And with that, I'm gonna talk about how I think these two games relate to building an army of war gamers. The first thing that I learned with Carrier Hunt is you have to adapt to players. Um, we were down at the sponsor running a week long play test of carrier hunt. And as a result of that, one of the, one of the play tests, the players, they ended up losing the game at the very end because of a bad die roll. Absolutely hated dice. They hated it. They then went to the sponsor. The sponsor came back to us and said, no dice, just, just remove dice. So we did that. We, we made the game completely deterministic as a result, and they actually ended up liking it. Um, well, of course, it's a good part of any war game is, or any training game is learning to lose. There's also, with Carrier Hunt, we wanted them to learn specific things, and we didn't want them so focused on how, learning how to lose that we ended up doing that. The other thing that I took away from Carrier Hunt and what I thought was the real power of it is design games for other people to run. And as part of that, don't just run a game for someone else to run, but run a game that they want to run. Um, it's been so amazing and powerful to watch other people run Carrier Hunt and, and to watch that get perpetuated way after I went hands off the wheel and, and let my game go off to college. Um, the next the next game is also a training game, um, and it's sort of the, the evolution of my training games, is EAB Hunt. And the main thing I took away from EAB Hunt is use things that people are familiar with, um, especially as you're trying to reach out to people that, that aren't familiar with war games as a concept and you're trying to bring them into it slowly, use things they're familiar with. So with EAB Hunt, I include Jenga as, as the main stochastic randomness mechanic and it embodies risk. And it's the nice thing about it is everybody that I've run this game for in, in a dozen or so play tests, they all know Jenga. They all instantly know how to play that part of the game. So I don't have to explain it to them. And then it's sort of watching them as we start off with the normal Jenga tower. They're like, okay, I, I can do this. And then as it grows and grows and grows and eventually falls, it's watching, watching their behavior change as part of that. 
and it's all it's all hearkening to something that they're familiar with to this game that they played as a child perhaps still play um i found that incredibly valuable for for bringing people into wargaming and with that i'm going to I'm going to have a couple of quick parting thoughts. So the first is I'm a nerd. I think most people that war game self self describe themselves as nerds. And there's, there's an interesting dynamic of we're going to bring this nerdy thing to people that, that maybe aren't nerds. And I found sort of two ways to approach this. So the first is embrace it. Um, and the second is sneak it in. Um, and this sort of reminds me when I was first dating my wife, uh, when I'd cook some things, I'd have the hot sauce just out on the table. I'd pour it on the dishes just before we started eating. And inevitably, there would be a complaint of, it's too spicy. So sure enough, I learned relatively quickly, okay, well, I'm not going to pour it on in front of her because then I get that complaint. Instead, I'm going to do it in the kitchen, in the pot, so that it's ready and I serve it. It tastes exactly the same the way I want it to. But I don't get those complaints, and I think that I think that story relates over to trying to build an army of war gamers. For some, you can sell them on the fact that it's a war game. Others, you, you're going to have to sort of sneak in that it's a war game. The next thing that I've learned is you've got to for building an army of war gamers. It has to be something you're passionate about. So war gaming got it checked. You're passionate about that. It's got to be something else. If you're into surface warfare, naval surface warfare, go after that. If you're into aviation, go after that. Find the thing that you're interested in and use that to find other people interested in it and then use that to bring more people into war gaming. And then the last thing, and I may be completely biased by my own experience, having focused really on training and education games, training has to get disseminated. It has to get out. People have to get trained. If the training comes by a war game, you're going to get more players for it. You might get more players out of a training war game than you might out of an analytic war game. The next nice thing about that is... One of the implicit learning objectives of a training war game is learning about war gaming in general. And it's, 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 it's so valuable to watch people, they come for training and instead they end up walking away of, Ooh, I liked war gaming. And I found, I found that's really valuable for increasing the number of people that, that are into war gaming and want more of it. And with that, I'm going to hand things back over our moderator, back over to our next presenter. Thank you. I think I'm correct in saying that our next presenter is Tim Smith, though you guys will doubtless correct me if I'm wrong. But that was a very interesting presentation. It couldn't have been a more suitable segue for what I have to offer here because this is somewhat of a novel approach to building an army of war gamers. It's building an army of war gamers before they're in the army, the Department of Defense or any of the other services. This is an academic enrichment program that I ran for 16 years until my son went off to college and I had to get back into adult war game for K through 12. And basically it ramped up through the different uh, uh, age groups. So uh, uh, without further ado, the purpose of the program was basically as academic enrichment using war games with a multiplicity of learning objectives that are in the active discovery learning mode. So fundamental cognitive reasoning, problem assessment, decision making, social skills, grace and victory, resilience and defeat, understanding stochastic phenomena, dice are part of the real world, one cannot control everything. Um, and there's a lot of literature on this, and that pretty much guided the, uh, the program here, um, with decision-making being a big part of it, because making good choices is, is such a selling point um, in the K-12 uh, culture. So the purpose, then, is to inspire children, to motivate children uh, to achieve certain things that we want them to achieve. 
So because we had a mix of children, a lot of these uh, children did not necessarily fit in in sports. They were seeking our activity as an alternative. We wanted to inspire them with self-confidence, with joy of, uh, of activity and, and achievement, and, uh, and motivate them uh, with confidence to pursue uh, advanced reasoning skills in, in the standard analytic mode that is uh, critical across all adult disciplines. So basically, this was modeled on the work of Jean Piaget with an orientation to starting the kids through their early operational stage, moving them into, through concrete operations into formal operations. Because in order to win the game, you have to understand the game, which is a simulation model. So the core tenets, David Kolb's uh, active learning, experiential learning has been uh, discussed in, in other presentations here, but activity, exploration, multiple media, team collaboration, kinesthetics, um, the social uh, dynamic, uh, motivation because the kids really love the subject matter. I found that out when my son was about four years old. He learned to read through Pokemon because he wanted to know what those cards said. So this was a really interesting way to get kids to think hard about technical uh, matters. So the whole linchpin of simulation learning is a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. The kids want to win the games. You want to win the game, you have to understand the model. You have to analyze the model and make sound reasoning choices based on the mechanics of the simulation. Some of these were abstract, but some were simulations. So this is pretty advanced pedagogy now we're, that uh, it's when schools are moving beyond just talking chalk, understanding that you need multi-dimensional learning. And it really, uh, when you do wargaming and any simulation-based uh, analysis in training and in decision support, um, you're really, you, you've created a learning laboratory. They're running experiments. Their hypotheses are, if I do this, that will occur. And that is your classic hypothetical uh, conditional statement. And they have a demonstration, an outcome of success or failure. They do it with collaboration on teams. They have to formalize their strategies together and agree upon them. They must learn persuasive speech and, and uh, uh, confidence in that. So it's really a social science learning laboratory because most of the games are historical. So the basic format there is lecture and lab. My initial pitch to principals across Anne Arundel County, Maryland, was that it would combine stand-up teaching with these quote-unquote lab exercises in the war gaming. Well, the stand-up teaching didn't really work. I couldn't get teachers interested enough to come and participate, and I couldn't get kids to sit down and listen, so we went right into the lab exercise, which turned out to be fine. That was a learning curve for me. Everything has to be age appropriate, and everything must constantly ensure that the students, in fact, are uh, engaged in the activity. So uh, the format is very, very important. The collaborative teaming is vitally important because the development of social skills must work in parallel with the development of the more intellectual technical skills. Qualitative and quantitative reasoning, hard and soft skills really mutually support. They are not contradictory. So we followed the Montessori model of dividing the classes into mixed age teams. The older kids with the younger kids. This enabled me to run multiple tables as the older kids developed their coaching skills and the familiarity with the game. And it enabled the students to learn the games at much younger ages than one typically would introduce, as you will see in the photographs to follow. So each team would have a designated leader, and that would be the older kid, and he would have to learn leadership skills, which means he would have to keep the young kids active and engaged and enthused and confident, and they would do that without being aware that they're doing it. Simply because you want to win the game, there's some things you have to do. So I, I just uh, briefed that. So this is basically the Montessori model. Older kids teach the younger. That helps the older kids learn and the younger kids. So the simulation materials were board games. We've we'll seen pictures, lots of strategy games, lots of uh, miniatures, plastic miniatures. But all of them have quantitative cause and effect uh, in a logical, mathematical model of the scenario being portrayed, which is sometimes uh, fictional, sometimes historical. Um, but most of the kids wanted to go into the strategy and world history. I was not able to pitch business and economics, politics and government, and so on and so forth, although I worked up an entire curriculum. I'm hoping that when I retire, maybe I can get out and really do this right. 
So uh, again, I pretty much touched on most of these things, but this really is a teaching them scientific method of uh, understanding theory, understanding mechanisms, and understanding uh, uh, inference from these analyses to likely outcomes of given courses of action. So again, the curriculum really stuck to the first two. Uh, my great vision is for all of them. That did not come to fruition during this uh, partial activity, which was largely a summertime and a weekend activity. I'd really have to start my own school to do this. So we, we started with the kids pretty young. Back in uh, 2006, we did a game called Age of Mythology, which was a board game derived from the Microsoft computer game um, that was a real winner. Uh, my son uh, is in most of these pictures. In this one, he's the little uh, Korean-American kid in the blue sleeveless shirt. He was six years old at the time. As a matter of fact, he beat me in this game in 2005, legitimately, too. Um, then Axis and Allies. This is an early version of Axis and Allies that we were doing. You can see the kids are very, very engaged because they want to win, so they have to understand uh, force structure. They have to understand Army, navies, air forces, armor, infantry, battleships, carriers. They have to understand all of it. They, the games have transports in them, so they understand, have to understand logistics and lift. Uh, we taught them Risk, which actually is a well-named game because, in fact, it uh, teaches them to moderate uh, their overreach, but yet be sure to engage in in uh, sustaining momentum of their action. So um, and you can see that the kids love it. They love the dice. The kids love the dice. They really do love the, the, uh, the tension uh, of the uncertainty, and they will resiliently take the results of the dice as a, a legitimately given potential outcome. So they have an intuitive, stochastic orientation toward the world. This game, Civilization, is a board game implementation of Sid Meier's computer game. I did everything board games because you don't have to inculcate kids into using their computers or their phones. That's a done deal. I'm trying to step them out into a more social, kinesthetic, uh, interactive, heads-up mode of engagement. So my son was teaching young kids there. There he is in the blue. This is Age of Mythology. He's teaching young kids. He's handing out the pieces. He's driving the game here. I stood back and watched. It was very successful. As we grew the kids, as the kids grew, we grew the program. So we moved to the large Access and Allies Global. This is a two-part game based on Access and Allies Europe and Pacific 1940. Nine different countries, large numbers of kids. My, my son would run this game as he learned his leadership and management skills, and he it became the hands-down master of the game, while I was teaching other kids at a different table early Hex and Counter War game. So we had a large uh, repertoire of activities. This was Battle Cry. You, you might have seen a slide on Memoir 44 here and there. This is that kind of game. It's a miniatures game, but it has... Um, uh, Kind of hex encounter cause and effect rules with combat results so on and so forth terrain effects um and this was uh, uh the uh, battle of uh, second manassas in uh, 1862. memoir 44 this was the the normandy landing i had as many as six of these laid out uh my son then designed his own game this was taking um uh, a miniatures model basically the uh battle cry model and modifying it for napoleonics uh, using napoleonic miniatures and he did a battle of Auschwitz, and he ran that for the team um, using his uh evolving leadership skills um and his design played out well and it was a reasonably balanced game and of course then we moved it into hexes and counters so what we're really doing here is preparing uh grooming youth uh, just a small group you know think strategically act tactically think globally, act locally, for the kind of that officers, uh, officer corps uh, should encounter. And this was the point of Waterloo, uh, a game of the Battle of, uh, of Waterloo. Um, and you can see it had a number of different uh, uh, versions of it out, so a number of different kids would play. So that was the program. And the idea is if we could institutionalize that uh, across the nation, um, then we would have uh, initial grooming to orient the mindset toward the kind of reasoning processes that I think are very, very valuable for the officer corps. And that is uh, my presentation. So Tim Smith, over.
Thank you, Tim. And next up we have Damian O'Connell. All right, excellent job, Tim and Nolan. So I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, we've looked at wargaming uh, in a general sense, right, with some, some comments uh, from Nolan. We've looked at how do we get younger people into wargaming, say before they join the military, before they get to the you know, national uh, industry or, or focus in on, well, what if you are trying to create a, a culture of wargaming in a military unit? So, and we're going to look specifically at uh, Marine Corps units and let me get my slides here. So, uh, examples, right? And, and I freely admit this is not statistically significant. This is not scientifically valid. Uh, this is largely anecdotal, but I think we can still pull some valuable tenets from the experiences of the two units and their commanders that I'm going to talk about here shortly. So uh, the two units we're looking at weapons companies for both 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. I'll refer to 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines as 3-7 for short, and the other being a weapons company. 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, or 3-5 for short. So we'll start first uh, with uh, Weapons Company 3-7. So the main character in, uh, in this example is Captain Zach Schwartz, who you see uh, on the right in the picture. Uh, he's the commander of, of Weapons Company 3-7. So a quick rundown of who Zach is. So he's an infantry officer. He's got a background in history, having majored in that subject at the Naval Academy. Uh, he played work games as a which is the Marine Corps entry level school for all new officers. He became highly skilled in developing and facilitating decision forcing cases, a cousin of war games. Uh, when he returned to the basic school a few years later as an instructor, he ended up teaching his students using uh, decision forcing cases, tactical decision games, another cousin of war games. And, and while there, he was also exposed to uh, po the Poe River Valley war game, which Dr. Nick Murray currently of the Naval War College, I believe, created. Now in this picture you see, Zach has shown Captain Jackie Fisher, she's on the left. She's the intelligence officer for 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, another unit. She's gonna come into play later on. So, oops, getting these slides going. Uh, so Zach assumes command of his company uh, while it's already deployed. It's it's already outside the United States and, and the company, most of it at least, is on Okinawa, Japan. This is The time frame is uh, September 2020. So he's got two thirds of the company. The rest and because of COVID-19, Zach and the Marines are, are ordered to stay on Okinawa. They're, they're not really going to go, uh, go anywhere. Zach made it clear to those lieutenants and Marines present that he wanted the company to focus on war fighting and decision making. Uh, when, when Zach spoke to the, the officers about wargaming, he noticed that they didn't have much of an understanding of, of what he meant, but he quickly set to work to, to change that. So the first thing he did is he saw that he had lying around three computers from a, a hardware and, and software suite known as the Tactical Decision Kit. I, I won't go too deep in the details here, but um, Tactical Decision Kit's TDK for, for short, uh, a group of computers, hardware, uh, programs designed to help improve decision-making uh, uh, for Marines, to help with mission planning. Uh, the computers have a, a range of different uh, programs, call for fire simulations, but they also, it turns out, have a war game or two installed. So Zach uh, found you know three of these computers. He, he got the gear to link them together, and he saw that they had a war game called Close Combat Marine installed. So this is, a, some of you may be familiar with this, but this is a top-down, real-time, modern-day war game. And together with his executive officer and his sniper platoon commander, his other officers are away, he links the computers together and they start playing. And these two younger officers really get into the experience and turn out to be highly receptive to war gaming. In fact, the three of them end up playing together seven to ten times. On some occasions, they're playing single-player missions in the same room. Uh, and, and again, you know, the, the executive officer and sniper platoon commander, they really bought off on, on wargaming and not to mention saw it as a great way to pass the time during uh, quarantine. Now, the deployment is a busy one and you know, they're lacking sufficient time and, and wargaming materials. So this is kind of the extent of the company's wargaming efforts. Now, while on deployment, Zach learns that the Marine Corps Association, this is the same same group, same uh, organization that publishes the Marine Corps Gazette and Leatherneck Magazine, 
at a war game request program where they would provide free of charge six copies of the popular tabletop war game memoir 44 which we were, uh, Tim mentioned just a few moments ago, and they would do this to individual units, uh, specifically companies. Uh, so this is a, a perfect opportunity for, for Zach and his Marines. Zach knew about this game uh, from a fellow infantry company commander and basic school instructor. They had served together. And in fact, the things you see pictured here are those uh, that, that other uh, company commanders, Marines. Uh, in fact, there's a there have been several articles uh, talking about the Marines playing Memoir 44 and all those Marines, most of them, I should say, belong to uh, to this uh, other Marine officer. But at any rate, um, so Zach had heard that you know his, his fellow officer had had a highly positive experience with the game. So he made his request, and upon returning from deployment, he, he gets these games. Now, Zach didn't know too much about Memoir 44 before getting into it. He had read a Marine Corps Gazette article about it, but that was about it. But he had some background in wargaming, having been a wargamer. And he concluded that a, a simple game that could get his Marines buy-in uh, quickly was key. And, and Memoir 44 seemed to fit that bill. Zach also knew that he, he needed to know the game well enough during play, adjudicate as needed, and, and generally get experience. As Zach put it, quote, whatever system you at least be able to guide your main Marines through it. It can't just be a cold start return simultaneously with your guys. So Zach learned the game with his wife, Jackie, who I mentioned her fellow company commander at a neighboring infantry battalion. They, a game, or they played the game a few times. They got the rules under their belts relatively quickly. And interestingly, Zach did not immediately throw his Marines right into the game. Rather, he, he worked it into a pre-existing uh, staff non-commissioned officer, staff NCO, uh, and officer professional military education program, which focused on decision-making and war fighting. So every time the group met, uh, they would uh, typically do a tactical decision game. So war games, when Zach decided to introduce them, rather than seeming alien or, or strange, really natural next step in Graham's progression. The, the Marines were still focused on decision-making and war fighting, but in a different form. So the week before introducing the game, Zach assigned his staff CEOs and officers to read the rules and come ready to play. He provided an article on war gaming from the Marine Corps Gazette. So, how did how did Zach you know actually go about uh, getting? So he had his platoon sergeants and his platoon commanders fight each other. You see that pictured on the left. Uh, so, for instance, the sniper platoon command, his combined anti-armor section commanders, the from the 81 millimeter mortar platoon, might fight uh, his in the sniper platoon. As for incentive, gave the winners some professionally books and me. A lot of Marines like whiskey, you may guess. Uh, the group then discussed their experience with him at Wargaming is effective. Now, I'm not going to humor me initially, but it, it turned out that they bought off on Wargaming and they asked to do it again. Uh, he could tell the voice that they had had fun, and some of them clearly wanted a rematch. For instance, one of his lieutenants lost to the other. The two of them have a rivalry, so they've got some business to settle. From here, the leadership of the 81 millimeter mortar platoon introduced Memoir 44 to their Marines and it caught on within that unit. They started to play regularly. Uh, you can see a session of, of uh, gameplay of, of those Marines on the right. And uh, notice that th they started to play every other week. Uh, they started to ask him if they could pull the games out on the weekends. So they're doing this on their own time. Um, and they also started to ask about other war games like Flames of War. Now the other platoons, the sniper platoon, the combined anti-armor platoon, definitely had interest in war gaming, but up to this point in their schedule, had just been busier than the 81 millimeter uh, mortar platoon. Uh, and you know, the latter platoon was able to work war gaming into their schedule pretty regularly. Uh, war gaming for the company stopped after it had to commit itself to several large scale field exercises. Uh, but they've now got some some more time, more discretionary time, and Zach plans on getting all of his Marines to wargame more. Now, something I should point out is not everyone bought into wargaming uh, right off the bat. Uh, for instance, even with the uh, 81 Splatoon, uh, Zach saw some of his Marines question the, the point of playing war games and, and viewed the activities, quote, kind of lame. But by the end of their introductory session, 
even the most resistant Marines were trash talking each other. They were getting competitive. They were asking how to get better at the game and if they could play it on the weekends. Zach noted, quote, if you're passionate about wargaming and you make it clear that this is professional military education, this is what it should be, once your Marines start playing and start rolling dice and moving figures and getting competitive, they're going to have fun. He also talked about the role of competition in getting his Marines into wargaming. He said it's huge. It's definitely important. Marines naturally want to compete. They want to talk trash. And if you can cue in on that and channel that into something that makes them better decision makers and better at identifying novel situations, uh, building unique answers to novel problems, that's, that's huge. It's, it's critical, he said, the competition piece. Your Marines should want to compete. If your Marines don't want to compete, there's probably something up with your unit. Now, for next steps with the company, Zach has directed his platoon commanders to produce a platoon uh, professional military education program for his NCOs, and he wants Wargaming included. His, his goal, again, is to get all of his platoons Wargaming more often, and he's looking to get more copies of Memoir 44 along with the expansion packs. But that's not it. He's also wanting to introduce uh, some computer Wargaming. Now, some of his, some of his Marines are already familiar with uh, with computer war games, not all of them, uh, but, but Zach is looking to get some gaming computers that could handle a range of uh, digital war games available on Steam, the online gaming platform, and he's really interested in games like Combat Mission Shock Force 2, as well as games like StarCraft 2, war game, war game Red Dragon, and uh, Steel Division 2. But wait, there's more. So Zach's been selected to lead professional military education for all of the captains in his regiment, not just uh, the battalion that he belongs to, but the larger uh, unit. And he's going to introduce his fellow captains to uh, Memoir 44. So his plan is to have them uh, read ahead about the Battle of Montelamar and then war game that scenario in Memoir 44. He's really aiming to create a culture of war gaming in the regiment uh, getting not just his fellow captains on board, but also the platoon commanders. Uh, there's also a company commander's PME program with the regimental commander, the, the colonel, which Zach is hoping to inject wargaming into as well. And if you recall, uh, I had this picture of Zach and his wife, Jackie. Well, Jackie is now bringing Memoir 44 over to her battalion, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, and facilitating sessions for the staff. So you're seeing, you know, the work of just, you know, one, uh, I think, dedicated uh, captain and, and uh, wargamer how it's kind of growing and, and expanding outside of uh, his immediate unit. Now, moving on to our second example. Uh, so the main character here is then Captain Dylan Swift. He was formerly company commander of Weapons Company 3-5. So like Zach, Dylan's an infantry officer. He grew up playing war games. And in fact, his father, person on the right, uh, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Michael Swift, uh, was the head of the Air Force Academy Strategic Wargaming Club in the 1980s. So as you may guess, uh, Dylan was exposed to a range of, of war game titles and, and genres as a kid. After becoming a Marine, uh, he grew fond of tactical decision games, situa situationally based role playing exercises. As a lieutenant and a company executive officer, he started a strategic war gaming club at his battalion. Uh, the focus there, though, was an education. It was fun. Uh, when Dylan went on Marine security guard duty, he used tactical decision games, terrain model exercises, and role-playing exercises with his Marines extensively. And then finally, as a student and newly promoted captain at the Expeditionary Warfare School, he encountered a few war games both inside and outside of the curriculum. Now, in uh, 2019, when Dylan took his company uh, aboard ship as part of the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, wargaming became a pillar of his professional military education program for his lieutenants. And what he ended up doing was he used the war game 1775 rebellion to help teach the Marine Corps planning process to his lieutenants. I, I find this really interesting. So, you know, Dylan had a particular problem set and the way he put it is I've got these independent platoon commanders who support company and battalion operations. They don't do platoon operations. And these lieutenants have no training in the planning process or how to insert themselves into the battalion planning process to influence it. They don't understand it. They just receive tasks. Go do this, go do that. Dylan said, I learned how influential you could be if you knew the planning process, knew when to insert yourself, knew how to advertise your capabilities and limitations, and you could shape your own tasks or contribute to them because you're, again, an independent platoon commander. 
And so we said, you know, these lieutenants need to learn the process or at least be familiar with it, because if they don't, they're just not going to get tasked or the tasks aren't going to make sense or they're not going to be in consonance with the reality of their platoons. So what would this look like? Dylan would give a class, he would lead discussions, and he would hand out reading assignments on a step of the planning process, say intelligence preparation of the battlefield. He then would have the lieutenants apply what they learned to 1775. Uh, so it was basically a practical application, and it was fun. Once they learned similarly about course of action development, the lieutenants would take their plans and then they would fight them out, right? One side being the, the uh, colonials and the others being the British. Uh, and again, Dylan recalled that the lieutenants loved it and, and granted that the planning process in, in this instance was obviously simplified. The lieutenants aren't writing real operations orders with all the details that those include, but conceptually they're getting practice with the process. Uh, in addition, uh, Dylan had a recorder who would write down the big decision points, uh, why people change their plans if they change them and so on. And Dylan would have his players, his lieutenants, write down the analysis for each step of the process as it applied to the war game. And after the game, would debrief them on, the, on their assumptions and blind spots. Uh, he would ask them if their analysis was right or wrong and why it was right or wrong. Now, outside of these formal classes, he also ran an informal wargaming club, which met about once a week on ship. And they played games like Diplomacy, a Game of Thrones, the board game, and this club was voluntary, but many of the Marines in the, the formal planning classes would show up to these sessions. Uh, Dylan didn't enforce any learning objectives or outcomes, rather the club was just for fun. Uh, between four to eight Marines would typically show up, uh, sometimes this would include lieutenants, captains, majors, other times Navy lieutenants would show up, even a, a Navy doctor attended. And surprisingly, this got a lot of negative press from his command, from Dylan's command. The battalion commander, in Dylan's view, had a typical Marine Corps officer's view of wargaming, which is, it's frivolous, it's a waste of time. But this didn't stop Dylan, and he continued to, to host sessions. Much like Zach, Dylan agrees that if you're trying to introduce wargaming into your unit, you should know what you're doing. Uh, to paraphrase Dylan, you need to know the game, you need to be the teacher, uh, you need to have an idea of using the game to teach things. The purpose isn't to play the game itself, but to help you get better at something, decision making or planning, for instance. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time and you're going to send the wrong message to your Marines. You say you want your Marines to do this thing, but you don't know how to do it yourself. Um, something else worth noting is on ship, Dylan took advantage of the fact that he had a captive audience, just like Zach. You know, uh, there aren't too many places you can go on Okinawa. Uh, when you're on a ship, you're stuck on that ship. Um, he also found himself moving to different ships at times where he was the ranking Marine officer and, and he used his, his freedom to sort of do as he pleased with his Marines and get them to, to do some wargaming. Dylan would later use wargaming when his battalion deployed again to the border with Mexico in 2020. Uh, for the most part, he had a new crop of lieutenants and he ran them through his planning process classes again, uh, using war games to facilitate their learning. And once more, he took advantage of the captive audience opportunity. Now, coming back from deployment, being back in garrison, Dylan tried to do war gaming, um, but found it very difficult. And he, he mentioned that the Marines had so many other commitments and were getting work to the bone. And this shouldn't be a surprise if you know anything about the, the tempo of, of work in Marine infantry and it tends to be overwhelmingly high. Dylan noted, quote, you just get weighed down by the mundane minutia of running a bureaucracy. He also added that if you want to do wargaming right in an infantry battalion, you've got to have the battalion leadership on board. In a Marine Corps infantry context, from his experience, he said it takes battalion prioritiz prioritization to make it happen. It has to be the battalion commander who says, hey, I want to do this, come up with your plan. If the battalion staff does not prioritize it, it's not going to happen because they're doing all the other priorities. Uh, anything outside of the battalion priorities is excess, and as Dylan said, excess things get quickly excised. Uh, he asserted that if you try to do wargaming on your own and the leadership isn't on board, you're fighting an uphill battle. So to round us out, I asked the two of these guys, Zach and, and Dylan, hey, if, if you had a chance to go back and, and do any of this over, what would you do? Um, Zach basically said, hey, if I had those games while we were on ship, if I had Memoir 44, that would have been huge. And Dylan mentioned, uh, I would just have us do more reps and beyond that, um, use 
different games to teach different things. Use this game for teaching tactics. Use this game to teach history, so on and so forth. Now, again, these are just two examples. Um, so take, take from that what you will. But I think from their examples and from other research, talking from other people, uh, or talking to other people, here's some do's, some things that you should consider doing if you're going to, to do this in a Marine Corps unit. And I'd imagine that much of this is applicable to an Army unit or other, uh, other units in the, uh, the DOD. So I'll, I'll give you a few moments to read through these. And probably see some similarities. Uh, again, the captive audience, knowing the game, um, and tying it to some sort of learning outcome, objective, or program. Moving on. So, for my part, um, I would say that if the Marine Corps is serious, as it seems to be, at least it's telegraphing that, uh, it's, it's, it's broadcasting that it's serious about wargaming and institutionalizing it. If it's serious about doing this, doing that for its units, for its operational units, these are, I think, some of the steps that it needs to take. Things like, you know, encouraging regiments to hold wargame uh, tournaments, creating its own fight club. I know the UK fight club is uh, making great strides uh, over in Britain. Um, establishing a commandant's wargaming fund, uh, a sort of fund that, you know, people like Zach could draw from and get digital games, get uh, computer, get um, analog games like Memoir 44, uh, stocking your base libraries with war games. Uh, there's an order out there. It's still active. It hasn't been revised at all. I think it came out in, I want to say, 97, 98, uh, when General uh, Chuck Krulak was the commandant of the Marine Corps. And it mandated that Marines, all Marines, regardless of their billet, regardless of their position, their rank, all of them will practice decision making every day. Um, most Marines don't realize this order exists or that it's still active. I think it's time that we revise it um, and, and put some uh, senior leadership oomph behind it. And then finally create a uh, war gamer led community practice. The bolded um, acronyms just represent the organizations uh, or offices that, you know, in, in my view, would head up each of these uh, initiatives. And I think that is it for me. So if you got comments, questions, or curses, feel free to call, text, or email. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. So our first question is, do we feel that we have a shortage of wargamers somehow? And if you want to take a crack at that. I'll jump in quickly and just say within the Marine Corps, uh, I think certainly. Um, I think there's no shortage of gamers. I think most Marines play games um, of one sort or another, whether it's Candy Crush on their phone or it's you know Call of Duty on their Xbox 360. Wargaming specifically though, and war game, like board wargaming, what we traditionally think of as wargaming, um, is not widespread in the Marine Corps. Uh, I think people like Zach and Dylan are exceptions to the rule I think though that because gaming has become so much more, I guess, widespread and accepted in uh, you know American society and within the military, uh, that it wouldn't take that much work. Uh, it'd take dedication and resources for sure and people with vision and passion. But I think if you had those things, you could get most Marines wargaming, um, doing things like Memoir 44 or playing, you know, uh, was it, Command uh, Modern Operations, the, the digital uh, war game that I know is, is uh, quite popular a lot. But my two cents on uh, if there's a shortage, and I'll only speak about the Marine Corps, that that's what I know. So my perspective is the shortage isn't necessarily on the supply side, but rather on the demand side, echoing Damien's comment of we need more folks in uniform that that see the value in playing war games and how that's going to make them better decision makers. Um, I've sort of noticed from this panel that we've had a fleet and a core perspective 
but we've actually lacked an army perspective. So James, uh, I know you're the moderator, but I think you could add some value from that actual army perspective, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. Uh, from my perspective, we absolutely have a shortage of war gamers. One of the things that I was somewhere between shocked and horrified to discover when I started working with the army back in 04, fresh out of grad school, is that the vast majority of people in the army, one, are not war gamers, and two, have little or no interest in it. And the problem there is, as Matt Caffrey likes to say on many occasions, war gaming wins wars. Wargaming is practicing the art of making decisions. Even if the game is notionally irrelevant, it is incredibly valuable practice in that. And fundamentally, officers and NCOs need to be able to look at a situation, make decisions, and cope with the outcome. They need to be able to visualize what's going to happen. We have found again and again that students of ours who are gamers, whether or not they're war gamers specifically, they will come across the game that we put in front of them. They come up with courses of action and they move out. And the ones who are not are frozen because they have no idea what to do. And these are majors in the United States Army. They have led often troops in combat. They've been in charge of companies and platoons and they can't make decisions. So keeping things short, because we don't have a huge amount of time here. Uh, absolutely, we've got a shortage. The one of the key things that we're trying to do to get around that is to fix it is by the, much like Tim, we're running brown bag wargaming. The tagline for it is serious games for professional development because as was mentioned in the chat, one of the things you got to worry about is what happens when people who are hostile to this come in. So we're always vetting the games that we're putting on that and making sure, hey, a hostile GO, general officer walks in, looks at it and says, what are you doing playing this stupid game? And now you've got to be able to talk that person around to say, hey, this is showing this aspect of military history. It's showing this aspect of operations. And we have a decided tendency as a result also to shy away from anything that looks too toy-like. It means that in some cases, really great games on topics get dropped. We don't use Star Wars Rebellion, which is a really neat counterinsurgency game, as a driver for counterinsurgency stuff, even in the brown bag, because we don't think it would pass that smell test. But I can go on and on about this. The other thing I'm going to tag in is that when you're choosing the games, simplistic is useless, elegant is awesome. And when you are running them, and uh, Damien really hit on this with the Marine Corps example, you must, absolutely must, do a polished professional job of presenting the games. Mike Dunn and I and our crew, we will murder board, how do we teach this game? repeatedly so that by the time people walk in, they walk in, everything is set up and they have people standing at the tables ready to teach the game with a script that we have sort of hammered out so that it's everything that they need to know to get the game underway. But we should probably keep moving and uh, let's hit the question number the next. The thing that struck me as interesting was Q3 there. So how do we expand really the the tendency for, unfortunately, the war game groups tend to be white and male. And if I can take a moment on that, I am married to a war gamer who is a former Canadian Army, Army officer. And one of the things that was decidedly uncomfortable for me was that over the last year or two, PacSims has put out some articles on telling us some of the reasons that these disparities exist. And I read them and found them uncomfortable and showed them to her and she jumped for joy and cheered because she's saying, yeah, you better listen because all of these things have happened to me and you've probably done them without thinking about it. And you're saying, you're saying oh crap, I thought I didn't do any of this. So unfortunately for all that those are uncomfortable reading, we need to pay attention to how it is that we inadvertently wind up creating those barriers. Over to you three. Yeah, let me uh, comment on that because uh, I had the same experience um, in the K-12. I was working in the free market, uh, people who self-designated themselves to come join, in effect, the club, an activity that was not directed uh, by the chain of command, except maybe their parents. Uh, so um, self-interest was driver. And self-interest, to a great extent, is the driver in much of professionalization, particularly using techniques like war games. People who read military history in their uh, liberal Time and play war games in their liberty time are doing so by choice. So it is very, very difficult to inculcate that basic orientation 
broadly uh, across the workforce uh, without you know compulsory participation participation requirements. So I found it difficult to attract girls. And I found that the girls often did not like the very competitive nature of the games. There were games. We were fighting war in, uh, in simulation. And it's competitive, it's tight, it's tough, it's driven, it's hard, it's fast. And uh, they much prefer, say, pandemic and other cooperative games. And nor can I get much traction um, outside of the white, Asian, Hispanic uh, core racial groups. I, I had difficulties in that regard. Over. Just echoing some of those comments, I think the, the main thing, right, is is recognizing it and then incorporating different designs. I think there's room for war games where it's not strictly about competition. Um, earlier, I'd, I'd, someone had mentioned the, the 10 meanest uh, war games in, in a previous session. And I think, right, you have to recognize that some players some players are absolutely going to love that, like, ooh, I get to be mean in the game. And other players are just absolutely going to shy away from that. Um, the other thing, so I'm still relatively new to professional wargaming. Um, I'm an introvert, and I've just noticed that I sort of have to be an extrovert to, to basically do anything in this field. And I think it's just acknowledging that those differences exist and figuring out ways to make them to make them not matter anymore and bring and bring everyone to the table and allow them to play the way they want to play. I think I would only add uh, to Nolan's comments, you know, I guess underlying or, or underlining or highlighting the idea that we want everybody involved. We, you know, war gaming isn't just for white men. Uh, it's, it's for everybody and it's, it benefits everyone. Um, and, you know, maybe being overt about that. Um, I think it's, you know, it is interesting that Captain Jackie Fisher, a woman, is in an infantry battalion as an intelligence officer, and she is spreading wargaming to a largely male-dominated organization and being quite successful at it. So, you know, it, you know, I should probably talk to Jackie a little more and, and ask, how do you do this? And how would you encourage uh, and other uniform women to make wargaming catch on in, in their respective units and organizations. So it, it can be done, it is being done. Uh, is it being done to the extent that I think any of us want? No, but um, it is possible. So I, I, I see some hope there. And that really flows on to another one of our questions on how we get the wargamers comfortable enough to come out of the basement and be examples of successful wargamers. And I'm going to poke straight at Nolan with this, since you, like me, have, have come out of the closet as an introvert. So what do we do to get Nolan out of the closet? Oh, I was, I was going to, I was not going to answer this question. Um, <laughs> So I think it's, um, as I, I was going to say, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's a matter of accepting the inherent nerdiness of what you're doing and being comfortable with that, either comfortable interacting with other people that like, okay, we're going to do a board game. We know that that's, there's a nerdy element to that, we know, or we're going to play a game and we're going to use that to make ourselves better decision makers. and acknowledging that it's nerdy and then right sort of for me it's sort of thinking through of ooh if i come if someone walks by as we're playing and they and they sort of give me that frown of why are you running this this game and wasting these marines time or these sailors times um of knowing sort of what my response is to that especially if i get asked that question and just sort of thinking thinking through that um, and i think that's that's how you get the, the introverts or the people in the basement or the wargaming out of the basement is that being more explicit about that association of wargaming is not about playing a game. It's not about having fun. It's about making better decision makers. And I think that's, that's really the key. Um, earlier I was talking to someone about it. You, you don't want to sell people on the idea of no, you want to sell them on the, on something that they already agree with. And I don't think people are going to disagree with the fact that we need better decision makers and better decision making. 
it's not a comment on the current state of things, but rather there's always room for improvement. And I think that's that's how you get war gaming to come out of the basement, is associating it with better decision making. All right, Tim, Damien. I'll just quickly add, I think um, you can attack it from some additional angle from the Marine Corps. If the Commandant of the Marine Corps was recorded playing a game of Memoir 44 or some other or uh, the, commander, the battalion commander were playing these games and, and doing so in an overt way um, and letting, you know, making it clear, like Noel was saying, this is, you know, this is a bid to improve our decision-making skills, to make us better warfighters, combat effective. That I think helps to lay the groundwork for people to feel comfortable and, and, and come out and, and for those units to harness the talent, the skill, the insight, the experience of, you know, of their closet war gamers. I think beyond that, um, firmly situating war gaming in its historical context and looking at there are other organizations, other militaries that have used war games extensively and, and to good effect. I think it was uh, what Carl von Muffling, uh, chief of staff of the, what the, the, the Prussian army, I think, who'd said of, uh, of a war game, you know, this isn't a game at all, it's training for war. And I think the Germans have a thing to teach us about uh, war fighting effectiveness. So uh, I, think, um, I think this is a, you know, it's a complex problem, but its solution requires multiple thrusts or, or, or uh, multiple angles to, to, to solve it. I think part of it, in addition, is to ensure that when we execute the war games, the mission orientation is made quite clear. When I run my training games with the Office of Naval Intelligence, I run basically through the military decision-making process, or the job, the joint operational planning process, using structured templates, uh, decision support templates and matrix, so on and so forth, to get them to analyze the model and, and make uh, command decisions according to the planning process. It must be a training for war. It must be practicing enhanced the standard skills. And they learn history uh, as a uh, benefit. But the main thing is they're supporting the mission capabilities that the chain of command wants them to excel in. That is the key selling point. It has to be tied to mission. What does the commander need his troops to be able to do? Over. Thank you. All right, and we'll have one last question. Jake, could you put up, there we go. So final question is, what can we do to help promote a fight club so that more people wind up going into wargaming? It's really following off that previous question. Well, I would say that we should get the leadership uh, buy-in that both uh, you, uh, Damien, and Nolan have been talking about. We really have to get leadership buy-in. There has to be some sort of um, uh, honor uh, reward system, uh, potential scorekeeping. Um, I've always had a vision of, of having a career-long training of the officer corps on vassal with civilian givers reporting out the results. And if you don't win, you report out your reason for your analysis of your defeat and you've improved your performance. And this should simply be a military skill set that um, is rewarded. And so it needs to be career beneficial. It needs to be uh, um, career enhancing to do this at, at all levels. So there has to be some kind of reward. Uh, it needs to be a fit rep. Uh, also, is a fit report uh, line item uh, that you demonstrate skill in command decision-making and military decision-making process. Yeah, I, I don't think I would add much to that. I agree completely. Um, it should be rewarded. It should be incentivized. Where people are wargaming, it should be encouraged. And the services should look to create its own fight club. I mean, there's a, as I understand it, and I've, I've just started to learn about its development, but there's a, I think, Fight Club US, and it's modeled off of Fight Club UK. That might be the point. Um, you know, First, you know, identify where war gamers are, where, where they are war gaming, uh, encourage them, reward them, incentivize war gaming, and then try to make 
uh, between, say, fight clubs uh, within the organization and then across. And and again, I think Tim hit the nail on the head with you know what that would look like. The last thing I'll add is DOD started having hackathons when it wanted to increase the the eminence of cyber within DOD. I'd say do the same thing with war games. Start having war game athons. Invite people from all over DOD and outside to to war games and compete. With that, I just want to bounce it back to James and ask for your perspective on how do we get a DOD wide joint service uh, fight club going on? Well, as many of you have pointed out, if we get if we get a institutional level support for it, then it's going to spread more. Uh, I think it was Damien who said, if you get the Commandant of the Marine Corps playing Memoir 44, then it might suddenly gain a lot more traction. And likewise, if we could get the Chief of the Staff of, staff of the Army playing some war game, you know, Battle for Moscow is something we use a lot, then maybe it would gain more traction. Uh, I know that the Army Models and Simulation Office is trying to start a fight club modeled on the UK's Wargaming Fight Club, and we will see where that goes. It's still being being argued over as to how it's going to work and what will be done to support it. But is there hope? There's some. We'll see where it goes. With that, we are also running past our time. Keep in mind that the discussion does not have to end because it can continue in the Discord channel where a number of you have already been posting up. But we should probably end the session so that we can clear up the channel for the next one. Thank you to all of you who attended, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you, James. Thank you, Colonel. Ian and Nolan, great, great work with you. I hope to see you again soon. Likewise. Thanks, Jens. Likewise. Thank you. Over now.